Hi, hi everybody. Please don't be surprised that I'm holding a microphone and it's not doing anything. <laughs> this is just a fun thing that we like to do. No, actually we're streaming everything and in order to have the sound, we need to hold this, but yeah, I mean, it's just a little bit awkward for the people who have to hold it, but whatever, you'll get over it. <clears throat> so will I. Um, so welcome to the service design drinks. Uh, we're very happy that a lot of you showed up and we're also very happy that not the 400 people who signed up showed up because then we would have been in serious in serious uh, problems. Um, one thing I'm super interested in that I want to um, check is who is at the service design drinks for the first time? Wow. That's super cool <laughs> because I was actually wondering, maybe it's because I'm not wearing my glasses because there were so many new faces, but I just checked with Martin. And so I suppose you all heard through this uh, because of Toa or something, right? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. So it's, of course, very nice for us to have a lot of new people here. Um, uh, so whoever is not familiar to the service design drinks, I'm just going to say something quickly about what this is and what we do. Um, today, we're going to have a talk about service design and the Internet of Things, which is a big topic um, and there's a lot to talk about and we have uh, four specialists talking to us today. Um, but first of all, so service design, the service design drinks are organized by Service Design Berlin and of course you're all wondering because you don't know us yet who we are and this is who we are. Uh, we're Katrin and myself. Manuel, Martin, and Mauro. Mauro, you can find right behind the camera, who's actually the reason why we're holding this. Um, unfortunately, Katrin and Manuel cannot be here today. Um, however, you have the pleasure of meeting Martin and myself. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're Service Design Berlin. We're a nonprofit organization. We've been doing the service design drinks for the last three, four years now. We try to do them every six weeks. Everybody who knows us knows it's not true. We do them probably every 10 weeks. Um, so where are we today? Um, in a very special location. So the host today is uh, Fab Lab Berlin. And we have the founder right here, Wolf, who will say something in two seconds. <laughs> I'm just quickly <laughs> I'm just quickly going to say something very important for after the event and also for everybody who already um, had the pleasure of enjoying a cold beer. Here's how we do this. There's a magic box. Right here, yeah, please show around. Make sure everybody sees it. Um, so we do this donation based. So of course, in order to have the pleasure to be here again, maybe at some point. It would be great if all of you guys could put in one euro fifty or two euros, depending on the drink you choose, I guess. Um, um, because we don't make any money with this, so we're not paying for this location. So it's actually super nice that we're uh, able to be here. And as I mentioned before, because we're so famous, we actually have to broadcast this event globally so that everybody around the world can follow what's happening in Berlin. Um, but let's get to the very important part. Who will be talking today? So as I mentioned, we have four people. They're four guys. They all wear glasses. There's a lot of things they also have in common, <laughs> but I just realized this. So we have Hannes, who is a design consultant uh, on a freelance basis. We have Martin, who is an experienced designer at uh, Nokia, to be precise, at Here Maps. Um, we also have Thomas Scherner, um, who is a who's a design lead of Internet of Things at SAP. I don't see him, but I I've, no, he's, ah, yeah, he's right there. Good. Um, and we have Ricardo, who's a service designer at Futurize. Um, so I would just say give it up for Wolf, who will talk about the Fab Lab, and then we'll give it up to the speakers. OK. Hello, everybody. Um, as I said, my name is Wolf. I'm one of the founders of FabLab Berlin. We recently moved into this location. Um, two, for the previous two years, we used to be. OK, now you can see me, but they can. Um, we used to be uh, uh, around the corner from here. Um, and it's. 
for us, it's very exciting. Also, you're the biggest crowd we ever had in here. So um, thank you all for coming. And um, I want to talk just two minutes maybe about what this place is and, uh, and, and what you can do here. So um, Fab Lab stands for Fabrication Laboratory and it refers to digital fabrication. So in this room, you can already see a lot of 3D printers and in these workshops, which you are welcome to have a look at later after the talks, uh, you can just walk through there. I don't think I will do a guided tour because you are too many, um, but um, you can have a look. We have a lot of tools and um, the idea is that you can come to this place, learn how to use the tools and then use them to develop um, hardware prototypes. Um, and that's it, basically. We offer workshops, and also uh, you can rent the machines technically to, uh, to prototype ideas that you have. Um, that's it. If you, if you have uh, more specific questions, our website is fablab.berlin. And I will also be around later if, um, if you want to ask me something. And then I have, hopefully, Okay, yes. Um, uh, you're here on an almost very special date because the day after tomorrow, on Saturday, after more than two years of Fab Lab Berlin already existing, we are doing our first opening party. So um, <laughs> we were always too busy to, uh, to do this, but now we saw it, now we have a great new location. Um, so we have the Fab Lab open air on Saturday. Um, and you are very welcome to join. If you look at our website or our Facebook uh, page, um, Fab Lab Berlin, um, you can find tickets on Eventbrite. They are five euros, or you can also just show up. Um, it's, it's a little limited uh, in numbers, but I think we still have uh, quite a few tickets left. So you are very welcome to, to visit us again on Saturday for a very nice par out, outdoor party. I think it will be very warm. We will have great cocktails, uh, great food from the local uh, restaurant and bar, Coco Bleu and La Soupe Populaire. Um, and a uh, great DJ lineup, so I think it will be fun. And we start at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and it ends at uh, 10 p.m. So it's not, it, it doesn't go through the night, but the party is really during the day. Um, yeah, so I would, uh, I would love to see you there. And that's it from my side. Um, thank you all for coming and enjoy the evening. Cool. Um, yeah. Um, taking over. Um, one, one note uh, for, the, for the folks who haven't been to the service design drinks yet. So normally we, we always have, a, have one talk and then interactive thing. Today we have three talks and interactive sessions. So Ricardo, um, our, our um, last one, is going to talk and then uh, does a hands-on session. They do the work. You do the work. Exactly. Okay, now switching my mode. Um, yeah, uh, so um, talking today about uh, smarter touch points and um, contextual services. Um, Hannes, Martin, um, we have been uh, working for, for quite a number um, of years and specifically on, on, on this topic um, in the last one and a half years we've been um, doing this uh, um, as, a, as a workshop format as well um, in, in, in universities last year and at, uh, at the ThingsCon, which is an Internet um, of Things conference um, as well last year. So it's a, it's a developing um, topic. Um, and as there were so many people who were like, ah, service design rings? No, first time. So uh, bringing you um, a, little, a little definition of what um, service design. Okay. Um, what uh, one one um, prominent um, definition? So service design helps to um, innovate and improve services to make them more useful, usable, desirable for clients, and efficient as well as um, effective for organization. This is quite a quite a um, nice description because it, it has both angles, right? The business angle as well as the customer angle, and um, um, as well, that it's not about only usability, but as well like uh, how how desirable it is. So having as well the, the brand aspect 
um, in the in the in the service. Um, so one good example um, that that covers that covers it nice, nicely is actually um, Amazon Fresh. So a service that hasn't been launched, uh, I think, in, in in Germany just yet. But um, overall, it's like this one uh, touch point you start with, which is like you you, you sign up uh, to the service. It's about like getting groceries delivered. And one main touch point then is actually the, the mobile application where you're able to um, basically order all the um, goods, right? And one core thing there is, is the barcode um, scanner in the application where you can just just scan the bottle when it's empty and just reorder things. And then um, basically uh, refine maybe your, your order and then finish this um, on, a, on, on a computer. So this really being the digital touch point and then the, the guy, depending on where you are, Say again? Exactly. Okay. I tried to speak up. Okay. Um, and then the the, the 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 guy, the delivery guy, might come uh, the same day or the next day. So you have like a, like a physical touch point. So um, crossing various touch points. Um, actually, this is what what uh, what this how this service is basically um, set up and. Um, and um, so the, the 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 angle of the of Internet of Things. I mean, you might be uh, already bought by by definitions over the over the day at Tor. Um, so, but um, so the, the the term Internet of Things was created by some smart folks uh, at the MIT um, in the 1990s. Um, and one popular one is like the Internet of Things uh, is an interconnection of uniquely identifiable. Um, um, embedded computing devices within existing um, internet um, infrastructure. So this being a definition from from Wikipedia, and it quite nicely des describes that it's this it's just not um, single components, but they they are like interrelated to to other existing um, services to an inter infrastructure and 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 um, like reflecting on actually. So as we as we just saw. Um, it is mainly handling this with uh, mobile phones, um, and in the moment, bringing the I IoT um, element to it. Uh, what what Amazon is doing there, replacing those touch points that were quite key actually for for ordering the goods, and having and having this uh, um, let's say connected stick, which is called the Amazon Dash. And what it does, uh, it it has uh, two affordances, two main affordances. It's two buttons. Um, one one uh, for actually a barcode scanner, which you can see here, and a microphone where you can basically dictate, saying, "Okay, I, I want to, I, I need some new toilet paper, and so on." And um, and the other the other affordance is basically this little hook, because actually this this special device does live in your in your kitchen, right? So it's a different place where where it's sitting. And overall, the service is not is not changing, right? So it's just one touch point of the overall service that is like um, contextually being remastered in a way. And um, yeah, and so it's uh, quite interesting to to see what happens there. So so when we re replace or or enhance like uh, touch points that have been before just on a smartphone with uh, with with objects with with uh, internet connected things. Uh, uh, it's quite interesting. So when when you have a look at this Amazon Dash uh, thing, it's 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 it speaks to you in so much more um, um, in, in in a way richer way than than a smartphone can do. So um, let, let's let's use an example. I mean, you, you can quite well remember a tool like like a hammer you you haven't been using for six months. You know, like the weight and how it feels in your hand. Can you remember like a smartphone app that you haven't been using? For so it's quite interesting what what's doing to to the human capabilities uh, in, in terms of perception and building deeper memories. So this is an interesting aspect, but also like, like internet connected things uh, take people better to to way better to to the context they are living in than than a generalized smartphone app could ever do. For example, this button, the the, the dash button, it lives right there where where you would need it, so you don't need to. Grab your smartphone, but if the if the washing powder runs out, you just tap the button right into the situation, and that's exactly where you need it. Um, and also, I like uh, kind of internet connected device, the the, the uh, watch. So so it, it gives you uh, very different touch points that are way more contextual than than the smartphone can be, and that's that's really the beauty that the internet connected devices can can bring. Um, so just just quickly. Uh, 
talking about the, the, the types of internet connected things. So we, we have here wearables, which are really interesting because they're very close to you, very like all the time with you and, and with you. Then we have, uh, for example, connected cards that are also quite close to you. And then we have uh, connected the connected home, so everything that's surrounding you at home, like like the light bulb and and the smoke detector and stuff like that. Then we go further in abstraction levels, and we have the connected city. And I think uh, we we're gonna hear a bit more about this later. So it's like traffic lights or sensors and trash bins. And when you abstract a bit more, then we come to in industrial uh, Internet of Things. So yeah. Um, um, containers tagged with uh, or connected to the internet or uh, um, transportation uh, that, that is connected to the internet and it's kind of improving the way services work uh, yeah energy supplies and uh, yeah healthcare as well and so the, the thing is now with 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 all the things and and we are particularly in this talk talking about more first three layers so the very consumer centric things what, what do customers really want? How can I deliver uh, uh, something? Um, <laughs> what, what do customers really want and how can I deliver that as an, an intuitive service rather than a standalone product? So this is more like the questions you, you from a from technology point should ask yourself because it's not only about like the things that I throw out there. They have to be meaningfully like, like delivered within the service to, to create a great product. And on the other hand, uh, we, we can take to this service design perspective and ask ourselves, how can a connected device help making services more usable uh, for customers and, and uh, more efficient also for an organization? So it's quite some uh, uh, two different angles we can have a look at this. Another example um, um, for, for good service. Um, uh, this is car to go I guess you all know this, so you sign up for this for a service, you, you get this badge, and then you can start locating a car with the smartphone again. Uh, you walk up to the car, you unlock the car, and you can drive away with it. So here it's again very smartphone based, but let's have a look when, when we replace this with uh, connected devices. This is uh, actually a concept that, that was created uh, with students we've been working with. Uh, last autumn, uh, it's quite nice. So they had a look, okay, uh, when do I actually uh, reserve a car? Uh, what happens there? And they, they figured out it's, it's actually not too great to pull out your mobile phone when, when you're in talk with, with somebody at a party. It's quite unpolite. So they've, they've been thinking about different ways how, how a, a special purpose device could, could help better in the situation as context to deal with the service. So they came up with this keychain thing where you can really just, just uh, feel through vibration that there's a car now actually in the area you are and you can just, just in, your, in, your, in your pocket kind of tap on it and reserve the car. And then afterwards you, you can use this as a compass to walk up to the car and, and unlock the car. So it's, it's really interesting because uh, it takes the context in, in, in which uh, the service happens way more into account than a smartphone could ever do and enhances it. So um, by doing, yeah, <laughs> sorry. So by, by going beyond screens and beeps, uh, we, 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 we can cater to the human capabilities in a way more interesting way. So, so really make services more human and make them work better in, in, uh, uh, in specific contexts. So uh, our hypothesis is kind of single purpose devices are built for context and, and able to fulfill a specific task very well. And uh, just a bit for inspiration. So, with uh, now being able to, to leverage like devices again that are connected to the internet and to services, we, we can talk to, 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 to people in so much more human way. So, so we can uh, leverage uh, like, like all senses, like the hearing and the feel, like balance and, and touch and stuff like that. Um, so it's really just, just to make you think about what, what we actually can do uh, uh, with the Internet of Things devices. Um, so just as, 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 as a wrap, wrap up and for inspirational uh, purposes as a food thought. So, so imagine your, your, as part of a service, your rental bike handles actually vibrate um, when you have to take the turn, right? So very, very embedded. Or another thing, like imagine your debit card changes uh, it, its color when you get close to your um, overdraft limit, right? So what, what if, what if you're going to have that?
um, or imagine your, your your train ticket sort of like vibrates and reveals itself when the train um, attendant just comes by. So there are so many ways how you can make a service contextually um, working in a, in, in a way better way. So and few recommendations when you when you look into this. On the one hand, uh, think really of of connected services as a as a part of the of the bigger bigger service system, right? So it's it's, it's part of. There's so many other touch points, and how does the interconnection of the different touch points work? Um, and really design, as Hannes said, like design for a very specific um, context and for the touch point. Um, the, the the Amazon dash button. I mean, it, it got some some people really like saying, "Hey, why is why is Amazon doing this 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 stupid button?" But actually, it's quite a quite a smart one, right? You have it right close um, to your to your washing machine or close to your coffee machine so it, like it, it makes it so easy and so well integrated to 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 reuse the service so lowering all the barriers that might be might be there um, and really try to to be less smartphone de 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 dependent trying to cut this off a bit and using rather those those ob objects as sort of messengers and last but not least really try to leverage um, the all human capabilities because this this, this damn piece of glass we're using uh, for the last eight years, it's, it's just, I mean, really, really, really limited, right? So, yeah, that's it. And um, <laughs> um, I think we have questions a bit later, but in order to keep the, the, the uh, time uh, schedule, I would um, hand over to the next speaker, uh, being Thomas, uh, design time over. Oh, yeah, time over. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, please forgive me if I don't speak so loud. I'm just recovering from a cold, but I do my very best. And I will also show a lot of videos that also relieves me a bit from speaking too much. But uh, if you have any questions, uh, just like show your hand and um, and ask and jump in. So I'm a designer for SAP. SAP is this super big um, business software company. And I also, before I want, to, uh, before I forget that, I want to say we also do have uh, small company startups. Um, so if any of you is working in a startup or particularly working in an Internet of Things startup. Um, you can also reach out to, I'll write that down afterwards, ICN, Innovation Center Network, .sap.com slash startups. So we have various programs for startups to um, yeah, get funding, get onboarded on our platforms, uh, partner, cooperate, and so on. Um, because also, particularly in the Internet of uh, Things field, I think there's a lot of stuff that's happening also on the hardware side. And um, yeah, we are a software company, so I'm going to talk about software now. And I'm looking forward to meet one of you um, maybe again later. Um, so SAP, yeah, 250,000 customers, 24 industries, 11 lines of business. So particularly everybody is in touch or in touch with an SAP system, whether you're sending an SMS or downloading an MP3 from iTunes or whatsoever. So 80% of the world's GDP is produced by companies who are running SAP. Um, that makes it quite easy for us uh, to get into the Internet of Things field because all the companies who want to do Internet of Things are also mostly customers of us who also ask us to enable them on the Internet of Things and to connect their Internet of Things de um, enabled devices to whatever network hub platform there is. Um, all right, I want to show one video to... to move you a bit away from that consumer field that um, Martin just introduced. So uh, we are not so much about buttons at washing machines, but rather like big industry, the outer circle. And I'll give you a short impression or introduction to that area, what um, challenges we have there, what topics, questions um, we're dealing there. I also get to two 
concrete examples afterwards, because I think for most of us who are not working in that field, it's rather difficult to like see the scope. People are talking, connecting, but not with their voices, with things, things that are close to their hearts and within arm's reach, things that are at their fingertips that measure their inspiration and things that are with them every step of the way. All of it is possible because the Internet of Things has made it possible. Billions of things talking to each other providing insights continuously. How are the world's best run businesses responding? How are they integrating the core of their businesses with the edge of the network? Simple. They're connecting the dots with technology that get these things to speak the same language. They're gathering intelligence and transforming their existing business processes. And ultimately, they're reimagining their customers' experiences, which in the end is turning millions of customers into millions of fans. And the technology company that's making the Internet of Things for Business possible, SAP. All right, um, so it's a marketing video, yeah. But um, I think it shows, it has some very nice pictures of all the industries you saw in there. So um, for example, in mining, if you imagine like this big mining pits, um, to to control all the different trucks um, and have them when they're like fully loaded at the different unloading bays or in farming and the big agricultural areas um, often there's like one company that's owning the, the the machines who are like taking off the crops and another company that's like having the trucks where the crops go in and moving them, them to the farm and of sometimes if they don't know the filling status um, of, I don't know, the, the madrasha <laughs> and the harvesters, um, then they're waiting at the, the wrong end and it, losing a lot of time over there. Or um, you saw the construction workers. So in Dubai, for example, there's many skyscrapers being built at the moment. And um, the cranes are standing so close to each other that there's uh, also a danger that they just like, um, when they are turning, that they are throwing another crane over so also the cranes are connected to each other and knowing the turn cycles of each crane so that they don't accidentally like yeah have an accident um, <laughs> so uh, those sort of bigger things um, they are also connected and then if you think like within a crane you also have a motor the motor um, can also be intelligent can be from another company um, that motor needs to be maintained and uh, best case it needs to be maintained before it breaks um, so we are also trying to, de to do predictive maintenance and service which means we have sensors on those machines that sense whether a machine needs to be repaired before it breaks so that um, downtimes can be reduced um, so this is one of the projects predictive maintenance the other is the Hamburg port uh, Hamburg Port is like one of my favorite projects because I like the sea, <laughs> people who know. Um, but also because it's a very interconnected use case. So we have the city of Hamburg, uh, one of the biggest ports in the world, and it needs to be, have, be even more productive. Um, but it cannot grow because it's within the city limits, within the city boundaries. So it needs to be more efficient to make a bigger, better turnover. And that can be done with software. And... Um, what we're doing in the Hamburg port is, for example, connecting all the bridges, all the parking spaces for the trucks who are arriving at the port or going from the port um, with the shipping status, with the ships itself, with the entire Hamburg um, city infrastructure. That, for example, if a uh, ship is waiting for a truck and we already know beforehand that this truck cannot make it to the to the port in the expected time that then the ship is not even going into the purse because that costs a lot of money it blocks the purse from another for another ship um, so those sort of things also when a truck um, the truck drivers need to when they need to do a break otherwise it's very costly for the drivers or the driver's company 
and um, when we foresee there's a traffic incident for example within the port area which is not covered from the normal navigation system and we also know the time schedule of the truck we can like reroute the truck to a um, parking lot on the still on the highway outside of the city of Hamburg to avoid traffic jams um, and to avoid that he's running into that critical time where he has to make a mandatory break um, at a place that's not so convenient um, so I also do you like those sort of videos? I have another video of that for the Amber Park. Sorry, I didn't make them. Um, the whole world is becoming responsive. Intelligent sensors can anticipate our needs. The Internet of Things is a game changer for the port of Hamburg, with a goods turnover of 140 million tons each year. Numbers are expected to double by 2030, a serious challenge for the Hamburg Port Authority. Located right in the heart of the city, with limited space for expansion. To grow, the turnover of containers needs to be faster. The port has to ensure that trucks, ships, and containers are only in the harbor area when they are really needed. The Internet of Things brings the solution. Every component in the harbor is communicating with each other. Ships, trucks, people, cranes, bridges, and traffic control systems. Everything is providing data to give insight to the business. Trucks reach their destinations faster. Drivers know where to unload more quickly. Shippers can plan their tours proficiently and react to new challenges in real time. As a result, the port can handle more goods faster, simpler, and impact businesses way beyond harbor premises. Okay. Right. So, um, and you can imagine like once these projects are running good um that's easy to adapt for any other logistics use case um beat mines beat um postal services so also like when amazon wants to do the shipping of all those goods good they also need some logistic systems in the back um, who provides them with the optimal routes and um all those information um so that's when the consumer world and the the, the big corp world is coming together again the other thing I mentioned before is like predictive maintenance. So all those big machines, particularly, um, they need to be maintained ahead. And we have all sorts of crazy sensors that um, do what usually experts will sense when they're walking through a machine and they hearing, oh, this, there's something that sounds a bit strange. I need to look at that machine again. So we also can do that with sensors um, and analyze whether the the frequencies um, of a machine vibration for example so machines have a certain vibration when they are running um, and over the time that that vibration is changing uh, if there's a screw unscrewed for example then there will be a different pattern and that can also be sensed and um, then also um, yeah alerted to some technician who can then take further steps to maintain that machine to send someone locally to that machine to have a look before there's bigger damage happening and that's particularly important in this like bigger fields oil and gas for example when you have like very remote locations somewhere um, on an oil platform out in the sea or somewhere in the desert some facilities you don't have the experts always at place so everything that can be maintained from f further away um, that's also very important use case and um, very big field for Internet of Things, where those intelligence in, or I don't, the things itself are not intelligent. They are sensor equipped. Um, they can send and sense data. And when we can aggregate that to make some sense out of it, to make some information out of it, then the intelligence still has to be at the human um, who can then decide what's going on. Or in the step ahead, um, when the machines start communicating by themselves with each other, then that's a real internet of things. Um, otherwise, it's like you said, still things on the internet, on the same internet that we have now. So I think, yeah, that's also how Google calls it, things on the internet. I think that is the better 
wording for it um, because the internet is still the same. Um, but what changes are actually the hardware components. And um, what changes is the amount of data that you need to handle. And there, of course, like if you're a company that has a lot of experience with like the big data handling anyways, then that's easier to do um, for the big scale internet. Um, but the biggest challenge will be to find a platform where all the things speak the same language, where you can then really connect the washing machine with the container ship in the best place. <laughs> all right. So my time is over, but maybe time for one or two questions. Yeah, so if there are any questions, um, feel free. How do you work? What are, what are you, what are you, how does the briefing look for you like? Just I would like to know. Right, um, so my team is actually spread around the globe. So um, we have people in Canada and India, which is like the worst two time zones you can have because it's not possible to have a meeting with both of them at the same time without having one of them stand up at night. Um, so Germany is in the lucky position in the middle. Otherwise, like on the bigger meetings, you have them twice, uh, once in the morning, once in the evening. Um, so we have, like in my team, it's 12 designers and several hundred developers. Several hundred developers. Um, and by that, it's a lot of like hierarchy still. Like even though we are um, like saying we are low level, but um, you need to aggregate stuff. And um, I'm also working with the designers, trying to find commonalities around the project. So um, as you saw, like my role is a design lead, so I'm not concretely working on one project, but I'm seeing, for example, if the the Hamburg port team needs to locate something on a map and need some special features on the map, for example, like a geofence to send messages to all trucks that are approaching the port, and another team that is doing um, something else and also needs a map, um, that those maps are the same maps and that they are developed the same, that they look the same, that they feel the same, but they, that they also get developed from the same, same people at SAP because it's very easy to, to um, oversee things projects who are doing the same stuff. Um, so it's a lot of communication for me, a uh, lot of thinking back and forth um, with the strategy and, and um, trying to find the common, also what I'm doing right now is to find commonalities around the project. So is there something that's common for all IoT applications? Is there something that's common for all the users, independent whether they're from the post or from the mining or from somewhere else? And that's quite interesting. And yeah, so design patterns, in the design patterns um, screen flow patterns, um, interface patterns, those sort of things. Right. I think we have a bit more time for questions later. But now handing over to Ricardo. <laughs> Is there any way to switch on additional light just for the for the camera? Well, anyway, somewhere from Fab Lab. <laughs> just turn on the light here. We have no idea. Thanks. Wherever we we'll, ah. Thanks, God. <laughs> okay. So just hold here. Okay. This is going to be tough. I'm Portuguese. I speak with my hands. <laughs> No offense to the Italians. <laughs> just, just more here, okay? Okay, okay. That works. So, hi guys. <clears throat> My name is Ricardo. I come from Futurize. We are a service digital agency working on the three fronts from business development, soft... There, okay. 
so yeah, I come from Futurize. My name is Ricardo. I'm a service designer and UX. Uh, we work. For, I work for Futurize, which is a digital service agency, and we work on the business development, software development, and service design. So the perfect project would say is when you can combine all the three practice into one. So, but I'm here today to talk about the city as an open ecosystem. So much has been talked about IoT and much has been talked about like smart cities and like Martin, Anes and Thomas have said, Internet of Things just makes sense if you have an ecosystem. Otherwise you just have like things that connect to you but don't connect to things around you. So how can we translate that to a city? So that's the question that I propose. How can we create a city where everyone can be an active part of it? Because until now, smart cities main domain is more on infrastructure and getting the life easier for the managers of the city. But that is a citizen. Yeah, you might save some bucks on your water bill, but you don't have like you don't feel the digital connectivity within the city. So a smart city, a base of the smart city is ba always based on an infrastructure that you need to have, like sensors, software, people on the ground that provide data. This is IBM and Cisco business models, right? They sell infrastructure, they sell software, which eases the pain of the managers, but you as a citizen, doesn't affect you too much. But you need that. So how can we turn the city into an open ecosystem? So the first step is to create an open platform. Let's call it an API will not be enough, but let's call it a huge API hub that everyone can connect to. So that means that business, small or big, startups or entrepreneurs, no matter the size, can have an active saying on the city and develop their business within this hub. And as well, the community should have access to this hub to a certain extent, of course, but should be able to build stuff within this digital hub in order to create like an open market for companies and the community. So if I'm an entrepreneur and I want to develop some kind of small app for my neighborhood and I need to use data and I need to use the digital infrastructure of the city, I can have access to that easy in an easy way. So let's go a little bit more practical. Um, how could we do that? So let's imagine that Berlin has a Berlin app that gathers all the citizens' profile, including the tourist ones, if you if you opt in. This is a service that you need to opt in, that you say that, yeah, I'm a Ricardo, I like this kind of food, this kind of music, I need wheelchair-friendly access, I want to choose what kind of data I want to, to give to, to this service, so as a profile with all my preference. Then, we're gonna have a profile for the service provider itself, from restaurants to public institutions to companies, they all have a profile and they offer their service on this platform. The smart city part enters in this. If you use all the infrastructure available and feed the data and provide a platform for people to work upon, you can have a context-aware platform that can make a better match with you and what you desire and your service. So basically, it's going from this, whoops, oh, that was too fast, but from this, like imagine that I want to go from point A to point B. I open my app, I get out of work, I need to go to my place, I don't want to catch the Uber, still I need to check what's what the Uber app, my taxi app, the BVG app, and then make my choice. And nevertheless, I never get data about the conditions of the traffic on the city on, at that time. I might make the wrong choice. Today we chosen a taxi that was slower than, the, than, than, the, than taking a metro. So if I have access to this kind of data, I can make smarter decisions on which kind of service I want to do. So it's basically, if I have one app, a little bit like Lord of the Rings, one, one, one ring rules them all. So it's kind of an app that, I, although I don't want to focus too much on the app as a solution, but gathers all this information from the service that you have in the city and provides you with the right solution. So finding a service, I want to go from my world to my home. And I have the citizen profile, which has like my data. In this case, we have like wheelchair friendly access. I want it cheap. I'm a cheap guy in that sense. And reduce my, my echo footprint. It's hardly combined it, but well, let's give it a try. Um, and I go to the app and I, the app knows that. I don't need to input that. And I opt in in several other third part services. The context of our platform that the cities provide, joining the data and the live data of the city, like the traffic conditions, weather conditions, how many people are moving around the city, 
it will bring me the most effective service that I belong to in a very easy way, so I don't have to browse it. And we will choose the right provider to abstract. So let's get practical. I'm at the street at my work, and I open my app, and it's like, I need to go, to, to go there. And he says, well, you have a service in your street. It's red because it doesn't match all your needs. But a few meters away, you have another service that you also belong to that can actually fulfill your needs. So that's the service that I want to go to my place. But I didn't browse to all the apps. I, I, trust, the, I trust the system because it knows taking into account the traffic conditions, the amount of time that I need to get home, the, how, how is the traffic situation in the, in the public transports, it will say that, for example, Uber might be the best solution or maybe blah, blah, car or ta my taxi. So I, as a user, it facilitates my life within the city. That's a way to connect to the city, not to connect to the service. Let's, let's get to another example. So um, we kind of define a little bit of the Internet of Things have many contests. And like, like Martin and Anna has put it, like, many layers and many, many circles many dimensions of it so we all start with a, with the inner context let's take whoa okay let's take john <laughs> and john is having a heart attack at a heart attack at home he has a bracelet right and this bracelet knows he has a, he has a heart attack and he triggers and he's alone and he triggers uh um that the house adapts to the conditions of him to be to easy the pain of john it communicates to the nearest fireman fireman or emergency service that they receive the information who is john how is it how is uh, what's the, his condition and actually we'll say which kind of hospital you should take because he has this type of insurance also the controllable context is the on the other side is the hospital and the and the, and the doctors are the the inner context that can control and receive the data it's not a very uh, it's not a very complex concept to, to understand true and it's not very innovative but the thing is like you needed the infrastructure in place to tell the fireman what's the best route how you can take how you can take john to the hospital what's the what's what what is john is connected to to go to to the next hospital you need to have this city this, this infrastructure in place and now i'm gonna run through my presentation because i thought i had more time to be honest <laughs> okay yeah so <laughs> thank you so okay for for the cities and uh, so i'm going to be a little bit faster but for the citizens you have like a better ux a better experience you have a more real-time real-time awareness of the conditions of the city and i don't need to browse the service i just opt in and the system does the rest for me for the community well if i have like an internet of things enabled infrastructure on the city that i can connect to i probably can connect i can control the lights of that park and i can control the water show or other kind of service that we come up with this is uncharted territory of course and there are many use cases that can come up with i will skip the example although it's a lovely lady but public services this is this is a big deal because for example how, how, how public service receive this information right now how we can get data 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 traffic for uh, traffic about data about traffic how can you get data from co commercial businesses how can you get data how, how many people are touring around the city so this kind of public service can receive a lot more data because imagine that you have all the infrastructure plus service like Uber being like sensors around the city providing even more data real data to these services okay practical example again John John is having a hell of heart attacks but uh, John is <laughs> It's a second one, it's a brave one. So John is on the plane, he's having a heart attack, again with the bracelet. It's, a, it's, the same, it's the same scenario with a bigger scale. They know who's John, they communicate with, with, the, with the airport information, the airport information can communicate with the emergency service, but to the point that the emergency service is picking up John, they have all the information imagined to take John to the hospital again. So service providers, let's be honest, not everyone has money to make an app. Not, every, uh, not everyone has even money to make a website as a business. So it's important that if the city is, it's, it's one of the main roles, and I would think it's like kind of a duty, is to promote the local economy. And if you have like an, an infrastructure in place that allows that small business can, for example, make use of an iBeacon that's part of that infrastructure. They don't even have an app because they probably can make some advertisement through this big app that the city has. You, can, you start opening a new media channel for these small businesses, which kind of enhances local economy. It can, it can be a nice platform for tourists to discover the city 
because you can create interactive tours and stuff like that. Again, uncharted territory, but I will give an example. Although I don't like fruit, but I love, I love John. But John is passing by and he knows that he, has, he likes like bi um, biological apples or biological products, right? But he doesn't, he doesn't, he, he says, the app knows in his profile that he's into biological products. He's smart, it's just client, uh, small supermarket on his, on his neighborhood, doesn't have money to make like a, a digital campaign, right? But if, if, the, if the city has an infrastructure, I know that I like apples, and if the supermarket is connected to that system, I just pass by and like, hey, John, I have apples. It just arrived, freshly arrived for you, and biological. And they probably paid a little money to just send that push notification to the CTL, from the CTL. Okay, so from the city, the city, the plat the city is a platform owner normally, but what to do, what to what they can do here with this infrastructure in place? They can enhance the local economy. They can make more revenue to the to the city. They can increase the velocity of money. And honestly, the most fair thing that in the capitalistic world we don't in a capitalistic world we don't have like it's a fair trade and a fair market. And this can be an enabler of of this fair market where everybody is willing and can actually make something in the digital space. Ah, and of course, you have better understandings of the analytics flow because I don't know, but Uber does, did something really heroic. I don't know if it was in Detroit or in Chicago, I'm not sure, but they were about to get kicked out and they just said, we give you the data, you don't need the infrastructure for you to get like this traffic information. They didn't invest in, in, in the city didn't invest in, in infrastructure, but it let it allow Uber to stay and they give you the data for free. So a, a city like Berlin with so many startups, so many business coming here, you probably don't need even an infrastructure for to begin to become a smart city. Let the business do their deal and give you the data. So ecosystem, for an ecosystem like in nature, you need to break silos. You need to break corporate silos. You need to break the silos between public institutions and commercial and, and, and businesses. We need strongly data protection laws and policies that can anonymize data, for example, and still be meaningful in terms of analytics and insights. And we need collaboration models. And I think service design plays a big role in all of them, but especially on collaboration models. And data protection policies too, because we need to come up with a with a with um with um with a metrics. How can something be meaningful but still protect the 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 user as in his privacy? And just to finish, there's no total solution for an open smart city or for any kind of smart city. Developing a smart city in Berlin is not the same thing that developing a smart city in Dubai. Different cultures, different digital landscape, different business that you need to focus, and different nat natural conditions. So that was a part of the presentation. I hope you like it. And that's the workshop. But I have. Do I have time for questions? Does anybody want to make a question? No. <laughs> but that's the thing. I think, uh, uh, yeah, I might bite my tongue saying this in public, but this is a very based Cisco and IBM approach. Back to the 90s, they were promoting like analytics, they were promoting like how the city can be more effective, but they were not promoting how the citizen can participate. That actually defines that that can help the managers to do a better job. That can help the, the city to have like a better like energy system or water supply. But as a user, yeah. Yep. Onto that concept. No, but I can tell. But I can tell there is a lot of signs on the market. If you look at London, I don't. I don't remember the, the exact name of the project. But there is a, a, a worldwide project about like not fun cities, but interactive cities, where citizens are encouraged to participate in making digital interactive tools to come up to 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 be part of that city. That's the, the in in the overall landscape of the smart cities. I think that's the most far away that we have been in terms of user feedback, not we as a futurized or as a company. But globally, I think that's the one that pushed forward, the bound, pushed forward these boundaries was this one. And still is a little bit too much artsy-fartsy, not, it's good, but it doesn't go to the service level. So, 
Sorry, sorry, can you repeat? What is the advantage of a city comparing to a private company that wants to fulfill this gap and, and act as a matchmaker? Well, you need to live in a dictatorship <laughs> in that sense because we are, again, ecosystem, ecosystem, like nature, need to collaborate. You need to, every, every mushroom needs to grow around. You have, you might have a big mushroom, but there are other mushrooms that will pop out, right? So it's about ecosystem. It's about like getting away from IBM, getting away from Cisco. But they do their job. Then they, we need the infrastructure. But then the ecosystem, everybody can contribute to that. So I, I understand that, but there are some already on the market. <laughs> All right. So I don't have any time for for any questions. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. So we have now a workshop and. Speaking about ecosystems, speaking about collaboration. So at Futurize, we come up with IoT service kits. So we kind of researched. There was not so many methodologies on the market how to develop like a design tool or having a design tool that could enhance the IoT projects ideations, for example. And on a personal level, I work with an engineer. I'm a designer. I think about unicorns. You think about like technical feasibility. So there is a lot of violent moments a lot of swearing that you don't get along so this tool is also to enhance a little bit the communication between you can sit down in a table a business developer a developer a user and a designer and all they get along so the exercise that i propose today we have different scenarios the kit is constituted by cards like sensors interaction cards open data from cities and service cards and user cards and we have like 3d printed pieces as well so how to use the how to use the kit we have like several blueprints around the, around the tables and this is a blueprint for example for for uh, for um, for a public square uh, we want to attract more people to that coffee so we have the user there is a little piece of the user you put the user you have a little piece of the drone then okay i put the beacon there the guy goes through the beacon it activates the drone the drone picks him up goes to the screen display oh cool a qr code and i get 50 percent on my coffee I know it's a stupid example, but it's up to you to come up with these big ideas. So this, this is just a practical example. How do you use the kit? So we have like different scenarios, public square, a conference, a neighborhood, a smart building that can be whatever you want, and a supermarket. So the challenge I will propose is like choose a scenario. We have briefings too, because it's a very short workshop. We have like, you have one, one mission to accomplish. Join the respective table. We will guide you through that and read the briefing and create and map your solution. There is some Futu people around here that will gladly help you to ideate. Christoph there, there's Faye, there's Neil, where's Misha? There's Misha. So there is a couple of Futu people that can help you out with this and we will walk you around. So my pro it's 30 minutes, isn't it? 20. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I was a bad yeah. cop. I actually do 20 minutes. We love bad cops, no worries. <laughs> so, it's a matter of choosing your scenario. I'm going back to the scenarios, and I can read out loud this. OK, who wants to do the supermarket? Joanne is a single mom, 20 years old. Joanna needs inspiration for cooking healthy food meals for her son that can only eat vegan. She doesn't have much time while shopping. She needs to get out of the supermarket as soon as possible. If you want to have the supermarket, it's here. Please join. <laughs> Let's maybe speed this up. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, public square is about uh, the check-in gate for restaurants. Public square needs to attract more customers. Uh, where's public square now? Let's go over there. So, that would be that. Okay, so the idea is that you participate in this interactive session. If you don't want to, you don't have to, but then please. Make sure that everybody else who wants to participate gets a chance to work in a team. Try to work with people you don't know yet. <laughs> and we are cutting now the transmission. See you next service design drinks. Ciao.